We've also seen recently history books become put into the form of the graphic novel. This one, the American Empire, uh, People's History of the American Empire, is taking Howard Zinn's uh, history textbook and moved it into the graphic novel format. Um, as much as he covers the historical events that we're all very much familiar with, Columbus, uh, all the way up through Clinton, he also puts himself in the, the comic. Very postmodern in terms of that, right? Having that author directly speaking to you with the book. Can you imagine having this as your history textbook in your history class? <laughs> it might have made that class a lot more interesting for you <laughs> to some extent. Because I personally love history. Hated history class. <laughs> it was just so dry and so uh, uninvolved in many ways. And this textbook in particular really makes you interact with it on a, on a much more uh, intellectual level in my opinion. <laughs> There's a book uh, that I think that is really, that really kind of shows this debate within literature and popular culture, and it's called uh, No Respect, Intellectuals and Popular Culture, and it's by a writer by the name of Andrew Ross. And one of the things that he really kind of talks about within here is part of what academias and, I guess, uh, intellectuals, why they have such a problem with it is that it is accessible to the masses, right? This is, it, this is popular culture. And when you think of university and academics, we have that notion of the ivory tower and their exclusivity and we're walking around with robes all professing things and <laughs> very much have that serious kind of notion behind it. Um, and that anything that is for the masses, well that's why they come to us, so that we can enlighten them. It, there's, a high, there's a huge level of elitism within that, right? <coughs> Needless to say, um, this, is this is what uh, Ross says, and I, I need really kind of need to read it to you so you can uh, think about it a little bit. He says, taste is hardly an aesthetic activity, but rather an exercise in cultural power, policing and carefully redefining social relations between classes. Um, and to some extent, this is about power. This is about universities and professors holding on to their intellectual power, right? Saying, no, you need to read that 800-page book that I read, right? Um, and that'll basically enlighten you into the whole you know, so, so that whole edify your existence kind of situation, right? Um, rather than learn it through something like this in terms of the popular culture aspects. <coughs> One of the first things that I really would want to dispel and I think is really important for not only professors but anyone to understand about comics um, is that there's a huge myth that this is easy reading, <laughs> right? Um, and why do you think they, they characterize it as easy reading? What's the main reason? The pictures, <laughs> again, again, because it has pictures, right? Um, this is what Spiegelman said about comics and, and really kind of how we, I guess, digest them to some extent. Ca comics echo the way the brain works. People think in iconographic images, not in holograms, and people think in bursts of language, not in paragraphs. This is really important because the idea here is the comics are by no means on a lower intellectual level whatsoever. The difference, though, is they are easier to read because they replicate how our brains function. Um, you, I, I need to throw you back to elementary school now for a second, okay? Do you remember how you learned to read? Dick and Jane. Dick and Jane. <laughs> Dick and Jane, or even in kindergarten here. Um, what did they do? They go, tree, and then what do they do? They showed you a picture, right? So when I say the word tree, what happens to your brains? What do you do? Everyone's going to have a picture of their tree, of a tree. It will be a different tree, right? But everyone will have their picture of a tree. No one's going to have T-R-E-E -E photographed in your head, <laughs> <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way, right? And then things pr eventually progress. We all need to go back to elementary schools and thank our reading teachers because they did an amazing thing by teaching us to read. It's just a, a very difficult thing to do, right? <laughs> but our our, later on, it becomes a little bit more complex. Those words start becoming put on word walls. And remember, they used to say, we'd read in circles, and they go, no one understands that word? Well, let's put it up on that board right here. And that became your vocabulary wall for the day, or week, and stuff. And eventually, vocabulary list. This is how we developed our vocabulary, and this is how we eventually develop our reading skills, right? So here's the thing. What comics do is they make it easier for our brain to process this information, because they're giving us the text. Um, they're giving us the text, um, well, they're giving us the pictures, first of all, right? Which helps us with the visualization process of our comprehension. But also the texts are given in short bursts of language. They're given in panels. And this is also how our brain functions in terms of communication. If I were to say to you today, or someone out there was to say, well, what did you learn in Steve's discussion about graphic novels? How w would you quote me verbatim? No, what would you do? What would you say? Somebody would say nothing. Right? <laughs> I don't learn anything. Right? Or you go, 
comics, right, books. You'd synthesize this whole conversation into a tiny short burst of language, wouldn't you? Right? Because that is how we function. And that's why comics are easy for us to read, because they're replicating our basic brain's comprehension skills. Right? And brain-based research will basically show you this. So the point is, there's no reason to think that this is any intellectually inferior in any kind of way. Because the content, especially when you read things like Spiegelman's Mouse, or Majan Satrapi's Persepolis, or American Empire by Howard Zinn, um, or any comic book for, for that matter, um, the intellectual content can easily be much greater than you would expect it to be. But your ability to really kind of synthesize it becomes a little bit easier there. Okay. <clears throat> this, in my opinion, gives comics an incredible amount of power, um, especially as an educational tool, right? Because um, one of the first things is they're accessible, right? Um, if the, we can get the material to our students in, in a more accessible way, well, they're more than likely going to be able to sustain it and remember it on, in a more substantial way as well, right? So you can, can you imagine an engineering textbook written in graphic yeah. form? <laughs> right? So we're going, no, we need that. We need them to make sure that they, <laughs> right? Because here's the thing, folks, I, and I totally understand it, is to some extent, as much as we want to, um, you know, embrace really kind of the notion of postmodernism, some of us do have our limits with it, right? We'll kind of say, no, maybe in literature, but not engineering, right? Um, so it's okay. The mass appeal that ultimately many, many people would, would appreciate this, that it can be a catalyst for social change. You can have socioeconomic political content in there in a very accessible format, right? This was one of the first political cartoons that was ever shown in our, in our country. Um, and what, one of the things that politicians really feared about this format was just how accessible and how much these, these formats made people think. In terms of Fetal Pride and Hogan's Alley, what we get is little Rosal McGraw saying, I'm just as good as the rest of you folks. Just because we live in the back part of our apartment doesn't mean I'm worthless to you. What it's really kind of commenting on are the socioeconomic inequalities that we face in our country. Right? And again, giving it in a very accessible format. That's, that's powerful. The idea here is it's time to rethink the canon. It's time for discourse communities, especially in literature, to really kind of evolve with the times. We may have started with from the oral tradition. We may have moved into the typography. Now we're in very much the iconographic age. Um, and it's time to really kind of embrace that in terms of our literature. It needs to change as we change, since literature is a reflection of who we are. Right? Um, there's definitely an aesthetic, intelligent, educational purpose to comics and graphic novels. And hopefully soon enough, you'll be finding them in your literature classes all across the, the nation. So, there you go. <laughs>